Praise the Lord. Good morning, church. Would you please stand to your feet as we prepare our hearts to worship the King of glory? It's so good to see you in church this morning. God is so good. He's worthy to be praised. Amen. God bless you. Let's just go before the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we are here to worship you. We're here for you and because of you. We magnify your precious name. As we lift up our hands to surrender to your will, we pray that you would just have your way in this house. Minister to every heart, every circumstance, and every situation. But we will praise you according to your greatness. If you believe that, church, would you clap your hands and give him some praise? Come on. He's worthy. Let's go. Two, three, go. Come on, clap your hands with us. Let's celebrate the King of Majesty. We enter in with praise and thanksgiving, right? Here we go. One, two, everybody come on.
name of Jesus. You deserve all the glory, God, and all the praise. Let's worship him. Come on.
church do you believe that today as we move past the gates of praise and into worship I would just encourage you that you would just lay every burden down at the cross today lay it at the, at the foot of the cross today God's here his presence is available to minister to every need let's worship him together love you Jesus we sing the words of the gospel today can I say it like this the Lord bless you and keep you make his face shine upon be gracious to you lord turn his face toward you and give you peace whoa let's sing it again the lord bless you His face shine upon and be gracious to you. Lord, turn his face towards you and give you peace. Yeah. Can we all say in unison right here? Say it, say it. Join, can we join together and sing? Woo. Sounds so good. This time in harmony. Sing it out, everybody. Come on. to heaven as we declare the words of the gospel today the blessing of God to his children to his people come on receive it by faith may his favor may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor yeah. be upon For you and to hide you and beside you, all around you and within you, he is with you, he is with you in the morning, in the evening, in the car. 
Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name. God, we want to thank you for this day. Thank you for watching over us as we slept and slumbered last night. Thank you for being with us and waking us up on this morning and getting us to church. Thank you for every person that's in the sanctuary. Thank you for every person that's in this building. Thank you for all of those who are on their way and those who won't make it on today. We want to ask Heavenly Father that you will be with us in spirit as we go throughout this day. For your word says, wherever two or three are gathered, there you are in the midst. And we want to thank you for your presence being here with us on this morning. We say these and all things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, who strengthens us. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Please be seated. Good morning, church. Yes. Good morning. My name is William Olivier. I have the honor to serve as the community impact pastor here at you Flourish Church, and I want to welcome everybody to church on this morning. Have a few announcements to share. Um, first up, we have our welcome card. You may have received one of these when you walk through the door this morning. It's our opportunity to stay connected with you all. If you did not receive a welcome card, um, there are some in the back foyer, and we will ask uh, back in the back foyer by the coffee tables. We ask that you would just fill it out. You can drop it in the offering bucket. You could also drop it in the black box that's in the back of the um, back of the foyer as well. On next Sunday is is uh, Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, and we're going to have our Easter service will be at our normal time at 10:30 here at U Flourish Church. Um, just before the service. We're going to have our uh, Rise and Shine Easter breakfast that will start at 9 a.m. We welcome everyone to um, come out and, and fellowship with us over my favorite meal, which is breakfast. I'll eat it three times a day if, if I could. Um, but we welcome everybody to come out next, next Sunday at 9 a.m., have breakfast with us, fellowship with, with someone new, bring a friend, bring a relative, bring somebody who hasn't been here for a while, and, and, and um, come have a good time with us. We could use a few more volunteers to help put that together. Um, I'd invite you to um, go to uh, 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 go to plug me in, and, and you can um, sign up to volunteer for um, our Rise and Shine Easter breakfast on next week. Last week, um, we announced that we have a You Flourish Church questionnaire. It's a survey. It's our opportunity to hear back from You Flourish Church as a whole, just on some things about about the church. Um, things that we may be able to do to help to help um, help lift you up a, a bit more here at, at U Flourish Church, and so we ask that everyone would consider um, completing a survey. There is a QR code, um, um, several throughout the um, um, back in the foyer. There's one up on the screen behind me as well, and then there's also paper copies available as well. If you could fill one of those out, um, you could leave it on the back table. You can give it to somebody from the welcome team. The welcome team is easily identifiable with those super awesome orange hoodies that they're wearing. I would typically have mine on, but not today. Um, so if you could, could fill that out, that would be great. That will give us um, an opportunity to just uh, learn more about what you all need and, and uh, how we can, um, can better serve you all as a church. We also, um, I mentioned Plug Me In earlier. Um, Plug Me In is... The way where you can get connected with us um, in the, the best possible way, um, we ask that you would scan the QR code. You can find information on Plug Me In about volunteer opportunities, whether you want to serve in children's ministry or on safety ministry, hello, or if you want to um, join a tech team or a worship team or anything like that, you can find that information on the Plug Me In card. Um, and um, yeah, that's the Plug Me In card. In a second, um, Pastor Ronaldo is going to continue us on our uh, uh, series in 2 Corinthians. Before he comes to the stage, we're going to ask that you all stand up, um, put on your biggest You Flourish smile, and greet somebody who is sitting near you. Thank you.
good morning. My name is Ronaldo. I'm one of the pastors here. It's always, always an honor. It's always a joy to open up the Word of God with you. We're in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. We'll start in verse 14. Uh, but before uh, we jump into the sermon, would you, would you meet the Lord with me in prayer? Holy God, holy God, Lord, we rush to you by the blood that Christ poured forth for us. Lord, I ask for your grace. I ask for your mercy to transform, to empower, to heal. Lord God, I surrender this time into your hands, asking that you would do that which only you are able to do, that which is beyond our imagination. We love you. In your holy name I pray, amen. Amen. Look, I am not from around these parts. I grew up in a very large city in Brazil and sports loyalty looked a little bit different there. The city that I grew up in had three major soccer teams. Now, I want to make sure you heard me correctly. I didn't say they had three major sports teams where you could support all of them. There were three major soccer teams, and they were all bitter rivals. And that rivalry that took place on the field expanded quite ferociously throughout the fan basis, and everybody had a team. And that rivalry fluctuated all the way from just friendly banter to, 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 to catastrophic violence. And that often took place in the stadiums, right? To attend a soccer game in the 1980s in Sao Paulo, Brazil, was not a family-friendly affair. You knew, you knew that you would not, you would never, you would never step into an opposing team's section. You would not even enter that area unless you had a death wish. We all knew, we all knew that if you stood in the middle of the fan base in that stadium and cheered for the wrong team, you were walking out of there in a body bag. And then I moved to the United States. And uh, a few years later, uh, a bunch of friends of mine and I together went to a baseball game. We were in Philadelphia and we went down to the Philadelphia, uh, 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 to watch the Philadelphia Phillies play the New York Mets. And while the Phillies were playing the Mets, I'm sitting there and I turned to one of my friends there who, who knew a lot about, who knew more about baseball than I did. And I turned to him and I said, dude, where did the Mets fans sit? And he said, what do you mean? Now, I was a little bit offended by his question because my question was pretty obvious. So I just asked it again. I said, where do the New York Mets fans sit? And he has the audacity to double down and say, what do you mean? I said, dude, if you are pulling for the New York Mets and you want to be inside of this stadium, where do you sit? And he looks at me and he goes, Ronaldo, there's a New York Mets fan sitting right there. There's one sitting right there. There's one sitting right there. Look, a Mets hat, look, Mets jersey. They sit wherever they want. 
And I said, and they don't die? <laughs> Look, I'm not, I am not advocating for violence. I am not advocating for violence in sports stadiums. I am advocating for clarity on whom you represent, right? I don't want New York Mets fans eating our soft pretzels, right? That's my cheesesteak. Get your New York hands off of it. Clarity, clarity on who it is that we are pulling for. Clarity on who it is that we represent. Clarity on who it is that we are following. While it very much should be playful in sports, when that clarity is lacking, when that clarity is void in the church, it can have catastrophic disasters. And Paul is, is, Paul has been saying, Paul is leading up to this point. He is saying, listen, we are ambassadors of Christ. We have a ministry of reconciliation. We represent Christ. We represent what it is that he has come to do for us. We are his ambassadors. With that, we pick up in verse 14 of chapter six. Paul says, Paul says it this way, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing and I will welcome you and I will be a father to you and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord God Almighty. We function as ambassadors, those who represent Christ. And with that in mind, Paul opens up with these words, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Let me begin by sharing with you what a yoke is. Right, a yoke is a, is, is a bar that they would put on two animals so that the animals could work together, right? So they would put a bar to connect one animal with another to, to, to combine their strength together so that they would be able to do what they could not do individually. But over time, this idea of yoke became this natural metaphor and it attached itself with burden and obligation and things that were necessary for you to do. So burdens were, were, were heavy. They were things that, you, that, that were pressed upon you, that were necessitated that you be up to. All that became flipped one day when Jesus said these words, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. 
Jesus said, listen, free yourself, free yourself from other yokes, free yourself from other burdens, not by just shaking it off, but by taking my on. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Attach yourself. He says, take my yoke and, and learn from me. Jesus says, let me be the teacher that you learn from. Gain from me. Learn from me. Yoke yourself to me. So then Paul, who is the follower of Jesus, says, do not mix the yoke of Jesus together with a different yoke. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Our verse starts off. Now, now here's what I don't want us to do, right? I don't want you to misread this and make conclusions that are not meant by this verse. Uh, uh, Paul is in no way saying, don't hang out with unbelievers. He's not saying, do not attach yourself to unbelievers. He's not saying that he couldn't say that because Jesus would defy that. At one point, Jesus says of himself, listen, y'all got problems with John the Baptist for this reason, but when it comes to me, y'all say I'm a drunkard, a glutton, and a friend of tax collectors and sinners. And every time I think about that verse, I think to myself, where do you gotta hang out to get that reputation? Where do you got to hang out to get the reputation of being a glutton and a drunkard and a friend of tax collectors and sinners? So Paul is not saying, do not do that. Well, what is he saying? Let me illustrate with an example. So uh, uh, almost 15 years ago, I had, I had just gotten my first job, my first position as a pastor and one of my job descriptions was that I was to oversee our Sunday school program, right? So I'm the new overseer of everything that happens in Sunday schools. And one of the teachers came and informed me, he didn't ask me, he informed me of what it was that he would be teaching next. So he comes and he says, hey, I'm gonna teach a class on Christianity and politics. And in my mind, I go, that's gonna be a disaster. But outwardly I say, hey, can we talk about that? So we sit down to talk about that and I turned to him and I said, hey, I have this hesitation with this. I have this hesitation. And the reason why I have this hesitation is that around our circles, a lot of people think that to be a Christian means you have to vote Republican. And he goes, oh, I think that. <laughs> and I go, this ain't happening. Now listen, I am not telling you how to vote. I am telling you that to tell somebody that to be a follower of Christ, you have to vote like this entire political party is adding a burden, is binding someone's conscience in a manner in which Christ did not do. That is to yoke yourself, that is to attach yourself and to say that all that this one partisan group, this man-made political party and all that they think and attaching that to the kingdom of God, a kingdom led by a rock cut out by no human hand, one that comes from the, 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 uh, a world to come, you cannot attach one to the other. We cannot be unequally yoked with unbelievers. I am not asking you, I am not trying to introduce us to a new form of legalism. 
I am not trying to uh, uh, attach ourselves to a strict adherence to a code. This is an invitation to a starry-eyed dedication to the man who is God. It's a starry-eyed dedication to the one who is the resurrection and the life to the stone that the builders rejected, to the one who was dead, but behold, is now alive. Paul says, do not be unequally attached or yoked with unbelievers. And then he begins this line of questioning. He asks five questions. He asks five questions back to back to back to back to back. And you might think that this is like a Tommy gun of questions where he's just spraying the questions indiscriminately so as to argue for his point. But this barrage of questions comes not indiscriminately, but it's this carefully constructed stairwell. It's this meticulously built bridge taking you from one place to the other. He says this, for what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? I cannot... I cannot invite you to go to our neighbor for their good and at the same time invite you to go to our neighbor to terrorize them. That's an impossibility. Paul says, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers for what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness or what fellowship has light with darkness. Light and darkness will not coexist. They cannot coexist. Once light comes in, it drives out darkness, but it's bigger than that. It's more than that because Paul has just described the idea of Christ shining, Christ shining in our hearts in the same way that God said, let there be light and there was creation. He now does that within us and he speaks light into existence in a new creation, which is us. How can the light of new creation have fellowship with the darkness of the old creation? Then he gets to the center of this. What accord has Christ with Belial? Jesus will not share his throne with an enemy. And he continues, or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? Let me attach those two. How can a follower of Christ and a follower of Belial lock arms and be on purpose and to be on mission together one with another? What partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? What fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? And then he says this, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? Listen, he's been building up to this one. He has said, righteousness and lawlessness can't. Light and darkness can't. Christ and the devil can't. The follower of Christ and the follower of the devil can't. And now he says this, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? The temple was the central place of worship. That's where humanity went to meet with God. And what, God, what, what Paul is saying is, is, is how can there be fellowship, right? How can the temple, the place that God instituted, how can the temple, the place where God instituted for man to meet with God, how can it have these counterfeit gods? How can it have these cheap knockoff imitations of God? But then he takes you that purpose for this reason. Read 16 with me again. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. 
He gets us to this point. Church, what he is saying is this. We are the temple of the living God. Do you know why Christianity doesn't have a temple? Because you are the temple. It doesn't need a temple built with human hands because it's got one built by the Holy Spirit, which is living and active and it's here. And what Paul is saying is this, you are the temple, the central place, the central place of of, of this is you, the church. It's us, the church. So if the temple is the one place on this old earth, on this old world that is in rebellion against its maker, if, this one, if the temple is the one place where, where, where we understand where humanity meets with God, how can it be defiled? How can it let other animosities infiltrate? It can't because it gets confusing and we misunderstand. And we misrepresent what it is to have fellowship with God. Paul says, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Church, here is what we have been designed to be. This is what we have been inspired Inspired to be we, not this building. We, as the people of God, are the body of Christ. We are the temple. We are that. And God says, I'm going to make my dwelling them. God said, I'm gonna make my dwelling among them. I'll walk among them. I'll be their God. They'll be my people. We're ambassadors. People should be able to come into our churches and see, oh, that's what it's like. That's what it's like to have a relationship with the living God. Oh, that's what it's like to know and be known by the God of the universe. Oh, that's what it's like when God walks among a people. We are the temple. And church, the Holy Spirit indwells us in the temple. Now, I want you to catch this. Some of you need to catch one part of it, and some of you need to catch another part of it. We're the temple. It means the Holy Spirit indwells us. If you have trusted in Christ, if you have seen the, the, the horror of your own sin, Stuff. If you have seen the wickedness and the injustice of your own stuff and you have met, you have encountered the truth and the beauty of the gospel that Jesus died for you, if you have turned away and if you have repented and if you have trusted in Christ, the Holy Spirit indwells you. God himself indwells inside of you so that you are to walk in a new way, so that people are able to see that's what a transformed life looks like when God is inside of you as an individual. Some of us need to catch that. Some of us need to catch the second part, that that's not only true for the one who follows Christ, that's a we thing. We are the temple, not just you, we. That means you got stuff that I need. 
That means I got stuff that you need. That means that she's got stuff that he needs. And that means he's got stuff that she needs because we're a body and we're not all the same. And you, you might be misled into thinking that you can function self-sufficiently, just you and the Holy Spirit. And that ain't how God designed you. We are a temple together. God dwells among us and walks among us and I'll be their God and they shall be my people. We are this temple. Verse 17, therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you. That little word there, therefore, carries a lot of weight, right? Like that, like that little ant that can carry like a whole lot of weight on its back. That little word, therefore, carries that kind of weight. Paul has just said this, listen, we are, we are the temple of God. We're not just proclaimers of the truth of God. We're not just proclaimers of the good news of God. We are the location where if people want to know what is it like to interact with the living God, they should be able to look at us and see that. We are the temple. Therefore, in light of that, Therefore, because of that, he says, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, then I will welcome you. Listen, if we are the temple of the living God, the things that are anti the things of God cannot come in. And that's greed, and that's lust, and that's self-righteousness, and that's arrogance, and that's wickedness. Not, not looking, please, please follow with me on this. Follow me on this. We're not here to create a new set of rules of, of do this and don't do that so that you can earn a relationship with God. No, 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 no. It's fully reversed. God has worked to transform who it is that you are. And in light of that, we represent him. Therefore, we ought to be different than how we used to be. We ought to be different from a world that is in rebellion against him and the things that attach themselves to us should look different than the things that attach outside. We should think differently from that. Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them. When, when the, the Old Testament people of God left Egypt, right, they came out from there. And there was all kinds of, of, of old culture things that attached themselves to us. And it's the same for us, right? When we are rescued out of who we used to be, the things that we used to be tend to want to linger in on us, driven by those same capitalistic, greedy gains, driven by old lust, driven by that old arrogance, driven by that old greed, go out from these things and then verse 18 tells us this and I will be a father to you and you shall be sons and daughters to me says the Lord God Almighty therefore go out from their midst I'll be a father to you listen God is coming to dwell in our midst God is coming 
to dwell in your midst. You know what it's like to have God dwelling in your midst? I always think of this. Imagine you wanted to protect your house. So you said, you know, I, I, I need a guard dog. I need a watchdog, right? And you're like, well, this, this, this Doberman isn't tough enough to guard my house. This, this pit bull isn't tough enough to guard my house. This German shepherd isn't tough enough to guard my house. So imagine this with me. You go out and to get a watchdog, a guard dog, you get a lion. Listen, ain't nobody breaking into your house. Like no one is coming in to your house. Literally no one is coming into your house. However, you better know how to live with a lion. You gotta know how to live with a lion. And what Paul is saying is this, here's what God has created. God has created this new people he created them by his own blood. The invitation is open. God has his arms wide open. No matter what you got in that background, no matter the nightmares that you have lived through, no matter the shame that you carry, no matter how unimpressive you find yourself to be when you compare yourself to others, God has his arms wide open and his love for you is so big. His love for you is unlike anything you have ever known. His love is not waiting for you to initiate. His his love is not waiting for you to first engage. His love is not waiting on you. He loved you so deeply that when you were in the thickest of your rebellion, when you had turned your back on him and said you want nothing to do with him, at that moment, his love for you was so big that he took on the fullness of your wickedness. He took on the fullness of your injustice and he died in your place. He died to remove that sinfulness from you. And when you trust in him, he creates this new thing. He creates this new thing that the world has never seen before. He creates this new thing that, that, that is unlike anything else. He creates this people that are his temple. It's where he lives. It's where he dwells. But you better know how to live with a lion. He's holy and he's good and he's righteous, and he has no place for injustice and wickedness. And Paul ends by saying this, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. This is insane to me. What you just read there is insane. Because what the origin of that, the origin of that is all the way back in 2 Samuel. And God ain't talking to you. He's talking to David. And he's talking to David about his son, about his son. He's talking about his son who will be the king, who will reign forever. And God is talking to David about Jesus. He's saying, I will be a father to him and he will be a son to me. That's the kind of relationship that I will have with him. And Paul takes that and expands what is promised to Jesus to include you inside of that. That's mind blowing to me. 
He says, I will be a father to you. You will be sons and daughters to me. And, and, and people from the outside should be able to look in and see, oh, oh, oh. That's what it's like when God is your dad. Oh, that's what it's like when you know the security and the joy and the love and the grace of God being your father. That's what it's like. That's what the children of God, each one individually having a relationship with God, oh, that's how they treat one another when God is their dad. When God is my dad and God is your dad, how do I interact with you? How do I honor you? How do I treat you? Do I think he's gonna hold out on me by giving more to you? Do I not think that what he has gifted me with also belongs to you? Is he not my father and your father? Does that not make you my brother and you my sister? He says, I'll be a father to you. And church, this is why it's so gross when church abuse happens. Because you go to a place where you're supposed to see. You go to a place where you're supposed to see, oh, that's what it's like to know and to relate and to interact with the God of the universe in a familial relationship and you see the horrors of abuse instead. That's what happens when we get unequally yoked. When we set our bars, when we lock arms with the old things that propelled us before. People come in and they ought to see what it's like to relate with a living God, but they get demons instead. They're looking for an oasis, but it's a mirage. They're looking for a warm blanket on a cold night, but they get a straight jacket in a cold jail cell because we misrepresent who it is that Jesus is. The most important question any of us will ever face is the question that Jesus asked his disciples. Who do you say that I am? And church, as those who follow Jesus, we are called to be ambassadors. We are called to represent to this world, specifically to this city, what Christ is like, what knowing him is like, what relating with him is like. We are his ambassadors. We are called to represent him. And we don't want confusion to hurt others. So because of that, we're careful with what we bring in. Would you pray with me? Lord God. Lord, I thank you for your grace. Lord, I thank you for your mercy. Lord, I thank you for your presence. Lord, God, I reflect on the the truth, the beauty, the majesty that we are your temple. Lord, I wanna lift up this, this little church. God, I wanna place this little church in your hands. God, I wanna ask for your grace. I wanna ask for your mercy 
Ah, Lord. God, that we could, that we could be a place where those who are tired and weary and broken and desperate, feeling hopelessness, Lord, are able to come and to see and to know that's what it's like to know the living God. We love you and trust you in your holy name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Ronaldo, for that uh, great word. We appreciate you. Um, now in our service, it's our um, time to worship and our giving. Here at You Flourish Church, we have three ways to give. Um, one of the ways you can give is through by texting a dollar amount to the number 84321. A second way you can give is by going to help our website, helpingyouflourish.org. And the third way you can give is in person. Um, I'm going to call our ushers forward and they will um, guide you all down the center aisle and then you'll return down the, the, the side aisles. We're going to ask that everybody um, stands up and participates in this, whether you're going to give in person or not. Um, that gives us an opportunity to um, have the, not have a traffic jam within the pews as, as people come forward. Um, secondly, if there was something said in the sermon today and you're um, wanting to ask questions or are in need of prayer or want to take uh, the steps towards salvation, our prayer team is here. Gus, Deanne, and Shelly are here. They would love to pray with you. Um, and so feel free to, as you come down, to step out to my right. And um, our prayer team will be more than happy to, um, to pray with you. Um, that's it. Thank you. So worthy. 
God, you are worthy. Lord, you are worthy of our praise. You're worthy of our honor. Lord, you're worthy of our full dedication. Lord, and we surrender it all into your hands. In your glorious, in your holy name, I pray, Jesus. Amen. You may be seated.